I'm done, Ron. I got in my service. <laughs> Please join me in the prayer of benediction. Oh God, your Son, Jesus prayed for his disciples. The Word of God is true. By your most prayer, hold our church community and keep it faithful to your Word and one with Christ in faith, love, and service. Amen. Now, Pastor Ron. <laughs>
The wonderful preacher Barbara Brown Taylor gives us a picture of a church where unity provides a comfort and security. It gives that comfort, security, protection. That's what she says. Like the brain damaged young man who showed up one Sunday and asked to become a member of the church. As carefully as he tried to hide it, it is clear that he's out of everything. He's out of food. He's out of money. He's out of a family to take him in. He's on his own. Now, how does her church respond to that young man's needs? Well, this is how she describes it. No one makes a big fuss. Very quietly, someone takes in grocery shopping while someone else finds him a room. Someone else finds out what happened to his disability check while someone else makes an appointment to get his teeth fixed. And you know what? Years later, he's still there. Front view, on the right side, surrounded by his family, the church. Do you see the healing and such unity, the security, the protection? <coughs> Parker Palmer in his book, Head and Wholeness, reminds us that, I want to quote this, the journey we are on is too tough to be made solo. The path is too deeply hidden to be traveled without a company. And the destination is too daunting to be achieved alone. It reminds us that all of us need places where we can be safe enough and courageous enough to face our brokenness and discover our wholeness. He calls them circles of trust. He says we need more and more circles from which we can return to the world, less divided and more connected to our soul and souls. Folks, that's the church at its best. Secondly, he prayed for preservation. That is, he prayed that none of us would be lost from the fellowship of believers. And he prayed that none of us would slip, ever slip away from our faith in God. I love the way the psalmist put it. We shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. 91, Psalms 91, 11 through 12. Christ prayed for his disciples' preservation. And we must never forget that we are surrounded by a company of angels, you and I. Jesus holds himself on the palm of our hand, and he will not let us go. He will preserve, preserve our souls, says the psalmist, in another place. He will preserve us all to the very end of our lives. As a good shepherd, Jesus took care of the flock he entrusted to him. He allowed none of them to be lost, except for Judas, of course, who had to be to fulfill the scripture. Now, shepherds know that sheep are prone to stray. Good shepherds leave those sheep that are safe in the fold and goes in search of the one who's gone astray, and so it is with us. Jesus doesn't let us perish. He will always be there for us, no matter how far we may stray. Christ prays for our protection. He prays for our preservation. And finally, he prays for our perseverance. He prays that we'll be steadfast in the faith. You can see why he prayed for those early believers' perseverance in the world depended on them. If they had not done their duty to witness to Christ in his resurrection, we would not have the faith we have today. And this would be an entirely different world because of that. It's impossible you see to overstate the difference that the coming of Christ made in this world. All you have to do is look at the barbaric behavior in so much of the non-Christian world today and imagine how far our world would, might be like without the influence of Jesus Christ. Jesus taught us compassion and understanding and acceptance. He taught us mercy and forgiveness. He taught us love our neighbor and first love of us. We should respect people of all faiths, of course. But it's horrible and naive to say that all faiths and all philosophies are the same because they're not. No other faith, for example, teaches people to love their enemies. Think what a difference it would make in our world if today if all nations, including our own for that matter, adopted that creed. We would not have the gospel today if those early believers had not persevered. But here's what we desperately need to see, and the real reason I'm preaching this sermon. The future of the faith today depends on us. Us. Just as surely as it depended on them. In fact, the world, future of the world may very well depend on us, the church. The world around us, as we all know, is changing very rapidly. Some wonderful things are happening, of course, such as unbelievable advances in medical technology. We talked about these before. The 21st century, we, we were going to, they tell us there's going to be advances in, in every field. But one thing remains the same, I'm sorry to say, 
And that's the heart of humanity. We are flawed creatures, folks. Our basic instinct is to look out for number one. Even if the result of that instinct is cruel, well then of others. It's simply what the Bible calls, of all things, sin. And because we remain flawed, the future is uncertain. We have heaven on earth, folks. Or we turn this earth into a living hell. And it's really up to us. Because the United States and Europe are weak in the faith, many people in the church no longer believe in the power of the Spirit to transform the world. Look at our churches. Closing. Few new churches. Churches, the influence of the world is not what it used to be. It makes you wonder sometimes, doesn't it? But before you get too discouraged, let me give you some facts that may change your mind. These facts are from a book by Daniel Meyer titled Witness Essentials. In 1900, Korea had no Protestant church. Today, there are over 7,000 churches in just the city of Seoul, South Korea alone. At the end of the 19th century, the southern portion of Africa had only, was only 3% Christian. Today, 63% of the population is Christian. Membership in the churches in Africa is increasing by 34,000 people per day. Per day. The only place it's not is here. In India, 14 million of the 140 million members of the untouchables caste has become Christians. More people in the Islamic world have come to Christ in the last 25 years than in the entire history of Christian missions. And in Indonesia, the percentage of Christians is now so high, around 15%, that the Muslim government will no longer print statistics. In China, it is estimated that there are now more self-avowed disciples of Jesus than members of the Communist Party. Even the most conservative estimates suggest that China, China will soon have more Christians than any other country in the world. Some suggest that maybe then China will send us missionaries. They're actively going in that direction. Across the planet, followers of Jesus are increasing by more than 80,000 per day. 510 new churches form every day. The irony is that except for the Middle East where Christianity was born, and Europe and America to whose civilization it gave birth, Christianity is expanding everywhere else. Friends, something amazing, something unexplainable is happening around our world. More people are coming to Christ than ever before. People are discovering that Jesus Christ truly is the way, the truth, and the life. That's because when Christ's work on earth was done, he ascended to be with his Father so that we might receive the gift of the Holy Spirit so that we might, we might bear witness that Jesus lives today. And people are bearing witness. And people are hearing that witness. Now, this is my final story. This is my personal story. Um, witnessing is a kind of a, a difficult thing. It always was for me. You know, what do you say? And how do you go about saying it? In what context? And do, do you uh, read a Bible verse first, and then you, or do you? In some churches, I know they have a little card that has on there. You know, you know, pray this prayer, and everything's okay. They, they give you the. How do you witness? What do you say? And what, where do the words come from? Is, is there something, some magical formula that you have is that if you if you repeat it, people will respond? That, is that the way witness is? Or do you stand on a street corner, you know, and say the world's coming to the end, and whatever? Uh, how do you witness? What are the words you say, and what do you do? I always struggled with that. I don't know about you folks, but I always did. And uh, but one of the things that I discovered was that uh, the Holy Spirit takes over where we leave off. And if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit taking, it, it wouldn't work anyway. And sometimes it's not so much what you say; it's how you say it. And the kind of person you're, you are, 
Well, let me give you an example. Many years ago, and it's getting to work more and more years ago, uh, I was I, I was asked to have a funeral for a neighbor, and he, he was uh, Jack Lee. Right? Uh, he was a good friend. He, he and I he started I started farming after I got out of the army, and he did. He came back in the service, and then he was farming, trying to get started as I was with, with his uh, father-in-law. Great man. I was, I was just, we were really, really close friends. And uh, he passed away. Now, that family I had been with, I had some of them in, in the youth group. Uh, I, I baptized some of them. I married some of them. I buried his family, his parents. You know, that, that kind of relationship over the years. They lived just up the road. And I, uh, I love Jack. Okay, uh, we, there was two of us at the funeral. Pastor there was the one that was actually part of, of where he went to church, and and then myself and uh, she had the first part of it and it was you know she did her part it was it was well received and then it come my time and uh, generally speaking folks I try to get my emotions out before I go to a funeral you know or either that I promise myself that I'll take some time to grieve after the funeral. You know what I mean? So anyway, I, it was my time to uh, do my part in, in the sermon. I went to the pulpit, and I, I couldn't, I couldn't say anything. You've seen me before when I just, you know, I had to hesitate and wait a minute or two before I could finally get going. But this was different. Uh, I couldn't say anything. I tried, and I tried. And I looked out there at that family and, those, and it just killed me. But I tried and I couldn't. So finally, uh, the, the lady that was with my colleague, she came up and, and relieved me and I went over and sat down. I never said a word. After the funeral, uh, the family came to me, all of them, and told me how much that meant. Said the most powerful thing that they'd ever been a part of. Neighbors, same thing. Folks, I never said a word. The Holy Spirit took over. Or his servant, me, couldn't do anything. But remember that when you witness for Christ. You're not on your own. You're not on your own. And he'll enable you to witness in a special way and meet the needs of that person you're sharing with. And I believe that with my whole heart. 